Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for that. Um, having stood in front of these audiences for the last seven years as a representative of Australian Ethical, um, I'm surprised but pleased by the results. Um, and I, I'm actually pleased also that I'm not standing between you and lunch at this point of the day, which I thought I may have been. So thank you, Toby and Jenny. Um, what am I up here for today? It's just to give you a really brief overview of some research that we produced last year. Um, we know as advisors, as an industry, that the great wealth transfer is um, underway. There's a transformational shift happening as the baby boomers transfer their wealth um, to the next generations. And this potentially um, will reshape who and how you give advice to and potentially your recommendations and service and value proposition. There's a lot of research that has been done um, in the industry covering the size of that shift and the wave, but little, we, ex we didn't think and we thought that there was little on the expectations of those next generations positioned to inherit that wave of wealth and we had an assumption that responsible investing would be something of interest to those next generations. So we're pleased to announce that last year we partnered with Core Data, obviously leading global research house um, run by Andrew Inwood, who obviously has a great reputation in our industry, um, for some new research on the financial um, advice industry covering both investors and advisors and combining the opportunity of both the intergenerational wealth transfer and the changing expectations around responsible investing. So I've just got about 20 odd minutes to share with you some of the insights and key takeouts from that report. Um, and we do have a QR code at the end and I think through the app for IMAPS where you can actually download, download the white paper itself. So the transformational shift occurring in Australia is evidently because baby boomers are transitioning from what has been decades of accumulating assets into a de decumulation phase with an estimated 3.5 trillion transferring between generations over the next two decades. Not surprising, you have been focused on this cohort over the past few decades because that's really where the weight of money or the pool of assets was residing. So no um, surprise here that when we um, asked advisors through this survey, two in three advised clients today are baby boomers with less of a focus in existing advice practices around um, exposure or, or a focus on Gen X and millennials who are likely to be the beneficiaries of the wealth transfer and millennials increasingly um, will, will share a greater proportion of this wealth. So the shift actually poses a really significant shift in our industry and a real departure from what advisors have been used to doing for decades now. And so over the coming few decades will be an opportunity for advisors to either ignore or to embrace the opportunity that this wealth transfer and the coming generations, the up and coming generations offer to the future value of your businesses. Um, we're pleased out of this research um, that 61% or three in five advisors are already undertaking some intergenerational wealth conversations with their clients. Um, but, but I guess that also shows that there's a gap in terms of two in five advisors that, um, that, that may be at risk of actually losing funds under management, losing existing clients and not being, I guess, the guiding um, advisor of those next generations and the wealth that will transfer. Um, so we're pleased at the result, but we also think it provides an opportunity gap for those advisors that may not be participating in this at the moment, or in fact, if you are um, thinking about it, actually thinking about it more, um, more, more consciously, I guess, in your practice and what you might want to do in terms of strategies uh, to embrace it. Just so we're on, all on the same page, because I don't know about you, but I think the generations kind of get mingled and what's what. Um, so I thought just to lay some foundations and some context, the baby boomers are the demographic cohort that followed the silent generation, and they're often parents to Gen X and millennials. So they probably, um, in fact, understand those demographics better than anyone. Baby boomers were in the right place at the right time. Following World War II, they experienced rapid industrialization, wage growth and booming property prices. So today, they're actually currently the wealthiest generation on the planet. In Australia, baby boomers account for 25% of the population. They have been the largest, largest cohort of the population for some time, but in fact, they manage over 50% of today's wealth in Australia. So they have an economic footprint, which is twice the size of the actual population that they make up, which is no doubt why, as an advice industry, 
with guaranteed superannuation, with, a, with an amount, amount of wealth that's accumulated over decades through this generation, this is where we've focused our advice and this is where the need for advice has been. But what you have coming through is Gen uh, so, so sorry, I should just quickly do a quick, over um, a quick um, overview of the generation. So baby boomers are currently aged 60 to 78. Two thirds are already retired. Um, and it means that all of them will reach retirement by 2029. So it's not that far away. So while they're considering their retirement options, they will also be considering the orderly transition of the wealth that they've accumulated. And when we ask these, um, this cohort, they are interested in the preservation of their wealth and the orderly transition to what has become very complex family structures. Gen X is between 40 and 59 years old today. They are the last generation to participate in the property price bubble, um, but have since faced economic crises, global crises, and they've also faced just recently skyrocketing mortgages. It's a generation also that produced some of the largest tech moguls in history. Millennials are 25 to 39 years old. They are the most tech savvy generation in history, having been born with devices in their hands. According to the 2021 um, census survey, they now equal baby boomers in terms of the proportion of the population that they actually make up. That's significant because they will be a significant consideration for consumption and investment decisions and also how we actually promote to them or how we engage them over the coming decades. And we heard a little bit of that in the last um, panel as I overheard what they were saying around Gen Y and expectations. So moving on, as we went through the survey, we asked advisors how many were participating in intergenerational wealth transfer conversations and what were some of the outputs or benefits that they were experiencing. So we found that engaged and proactive advisors that were leaning into the opportunity were actually realising tangible business benefits, more so than those that were reacting to conversations or prompting from their clients. 41% are proactively engaging with their clients children and beneficiaries and that in a bid to strengthen relationships, retain their clients, but also protect the future value of their practice. The other half are waiting and you can see that they have less tangible business benefits, less success, I guess, in retaining, engaging and conversing with not just their existing clients, but the next generations. Those advisors that were actively engaging quoted things like higher levels of retention of FUM, higher engagement with their existing clients and satisfaction from their existing clients because they were responding to this need to preserve and transition in an orderly way that wealth that they had accumulated, but also more touch points with the next generations. And it's really important to remember that trust is built between five and seven touch points. So integrating family conversations, integrating the next generation into these conversations with your existing clients, but also having some kind of comms plan um, that actually reaches out to those next generations is going to be really important for you to build trust and obviously develop rapport with those next generations so that you become the trusted advisor. One really incredible thing I think that came out of the paper, and I um, would regard this as almost a net promoter score of sorts for the financial advice industry, was the overwhelming trust and confidence that your clients have in you. And quite often we don't hear this as an industry and we've been kind of belted around over the past couple of decades as a profession. But it's further incentive to get proactive around the intergenerational wealth transfer conversation. Because your clients, if they're high net worth and they have over a million dollars in investable assets today, they unanimously said that they would re recommend their advisor to their children in the future. 97% of them wanted to recommend and were really comfortable, confident and happy to recommend their existing advisor. It does drop a little bit around the mass affluent, um, but still three in four or 76% of that core and mass affluent clients are likely to re recommend their advisor to their children in the future. So what an amazing opportunity you have over the past couple of decades through the advice relationships that you've had with baby boomers, you've built up trusted relationships that are lead gen sitting and existing in your business today. And so what a great opportunity at that point of retirement 
or at that point of wanting to think about their legacy, um, what a great opportunity to use that trusted relationship to introduce the next generations and you become, I guess, the, the advisor for the future generations and also make sure that you um, are retaining the future value of your business. Um, it's really important to understand that you have this beyond any other industry participants at the moment. And if you think about the quality of the advice, the quality of advice review underway right now, and some of the recommendations, super funds are going to be targeting this cohort more proactively than ever. So you should be using that trusted relationship you have now to start these conversations. And this is where Australian ethical comes in to the fore, I guess, is understanding those needs of the next generation. And the assumption we, we made was those next generations will potentially have different values, different expectations of their investments um, than the current baby boomer generation. And that's what came through in the report. And you can see that there's a growing proportion of the younger generations that plan to invest responsibly in the next 12 months. In that census survey in 2021, which I quoted a little while ago, it also noted that millennials not only were the largest cohort matching baby boomers now, but millennials, and I'll quote, are more likely to boycott products for social purpose reasons. And the RIA reports, um, I guess, support this proposition and this backdrop of changing needs. RIA, or the Responsible Investing Association of Australia, is the leading body that benchmarks responsible investing every year, and they also look at consumer demand and sentiment. And their latest report in 2023 echoes what we just heard. 83% of Australians expect their bank account and their super to be invested responsibly and ethically. 80% expect their savings to have a positive impact on the world. Most important for the advice industry is 64% of, of consumers now expect financial advisors to be knowledgeable about responsible investing options. And this, in fact, was the number one expectation from consumers above investments, portfolio construction returns, that you are knowledgeable in respons responsible investing options. Um, and as I said, a growing need from those next generations that actually are, are looking to proactively invest in this way in the next 12 months, which is really where the weight of money will continue to go. So an increasing expectation to offer RI solutions to meet those evolving younger, those evolving needs of those younger generations that are going to inherit that wealth over the coming decades. And being able to respond to those conversations and that demand in a really confident way that you have options available, that you have the knowledge to be able to walk them through the various labels that are progressively more confusing, and also to be able to walk them through the, the, and, av and avoid the possibility and potential of greenwashing. So advisors, as an outshot of this, need to learn the language and ways of Gen X and millennials, not just the current baby boomers that you're actually managing. And it's also almost a double whammy for you. If you put together the intergenerational wealth transfer conversation along with the responsible investing conversation, you start to see also some tangible business benefits again. So of those advisors that were tapping into responsible investing to support their strategy or their value proposition, we also did a, a deep dive on them and some of the business benefits that they are experiencing. So with this growing interest, we're really pleased to say that 91% of advisors um, through the survey are recommending responsible investing options in some way. It's not to say that it's a big part of their value proposition. A, a, a lower number of only 47% actually have incorporated it into their recommendations and their advice process. But still, 91% of advisors is a great number. So there's a lot of advisors out there right now responding to these changing needs. 46% um, declare that responsible investing is important to best interest duty. 52% agree it's demonstrating a strong understanding which can help attract younger generations. But more importantly, it echoed what we saw in the intergenerational wealth transfer conversations. Um, that advisors that were tapping into responsible investing in a proactive way, those ones that had incorporated it into their proposition, saw higher engagement, higher satisfaction. They saw more quality conversations with not just their existing clients, but with those future generations. 
So the outshot is that if you're able to put together the intergenerational wealth transfer conversation with an RI conversation, there's some really tangible business benefits to be had. And with that, we asked advisors how they're planning to address the opportunity. And no doubt, overwhelmingly, those ones that are leaning into it aren't mourning this fragmentation of FUM or potential risk to their business, but they are proactively engaging in the conversations. And so what we're seeing is advisors more and more are facilitating family conversations, but what you'll see is that's still only 47%. So we think there's an opportunity and we think that maybe advisors are leaning into retirement planning but not necessarily intergenerational wealth transfer conversations and that there is a, an ability at that pivotal point in a client's, um, I guess, investing journey and life cycle to be able to be more proactive on this. And obviously to weave in not just the intergenerational wealth conversation, but to bring the family on that journey, to be able to manage the expectations of both your existing clients and also future generations. Also to avoid any dilemmas. There's real risks um, as this transfer occurs, given that the divorce rate is well over 50% now and we have really complex family structures, um, but also some social issues that um, clients may well be traversing within their families. So, being that trusted guide through that complex process and making your clients comfortable and confident that there is an orderly transition of their wealth that will be preserved um, and will actually find its way through um, to, to, to be of value to the next generations, we think is obviously really important to the future of our industry, but also the future value of your businesses. So with that, um, that's the key takeouts from the um, white paper that we produced. Um, please feel free to download the QR code or sorry, scan the QR code and download the white paper. Um, there's some um, contact details on there. So for anyone that you want to have a chat with from the Australian ethical team, feel free. Um, and we're also putting together a follow up to this white paper around a framework to having those legacy discussions where we can actually help you start to proactively um, employ some of those conversations um, in your advice practice. Thank you. Before you go, before you go, perhaps uh, maybe we field a couple of questions. We got we got a little bit of time. Is there any questions from the floor for for Leah? Because I have one actually, and I'm actually quite keen to get an answer to. But please, anyone? Okay. Um, I've been very much involved with the responsible investing for a long time, and as you can imagine, we've all sort of got the scars from skeptics. And I think when you talk to a lot of advisors, they very much are from that boomer. Gen X uh, mindset, which maybe aren't really quite there yet. And I think one of the most important aspects of this is having an authentic approach as an advisor. My question to you then is, what are some of the elements or what are the principles to help these advisors start developing an authentic approach? Yeah, thanks, um, Nathan. First and foremost, I would say that um, Yes, it is an older um, generation that's generally giving advice, um, baby boomer, so probably why you've also built up a baby boomer um, client base. What we're finding is younger advisors definitely are embracing RI in a much more proactive way, but also what we're finding is some of the most successful company, uh, practices that are leaning into intergenerational wealth are actually thinking about the future of their business, the future service proposition, the future value, the future revenue streams, and actually bringing younger advisors through. Um, because there's no doubt that you're probably all sitting here thinking, that's a really great idea, Leah, but I'm at capacity with clients. And with the costs of admin and the compliance burdens, there's no way I can take on new clients. But if you can bring younger planners through to be able to have those combined intergenerational wealth transfer, they will be on the same page as those next generations. And they will know the kinds of ways to communicate. And, and they'll be able to sort of, I guess, communicate on the same level as those next generations. And it's a really great way of you future-proofing your business, but also bringing through some succession planning as well. Um, the other thing is, um, I, I guess it, it is doing away with the cynicism 
and the misperceptions or misconceptions around responsible investing. Um, I like to liken it to any active management style. I've been in investments for almost 30 years now. I've worked with a lot of different active and quant managers. And ethical is no different. It's an approach to investing that is there to produce a certain outcome for investors. We employ active management. We're index agnostic. So we are going to vary from the market at, at periods of time. And last year, during a global energy crisis where we don't hold um, oil, coal or gas stocks, there's no doubt that we will differ. Um, what we've seen in the last six months is small caps um, start to rebound from an undervalued position, tech come back, healthcare is still a little bit shaky in places, but we're starting to see the sorts of sectors um, that we invest in um, start to return and you've seen a, a rebound as you would with any other active management style. Thanks, Leah. Any other questions? Um, I mean, values are personal, and so um, an ethical issue for one client is not the eth and is the ethical issue for another. Um, uh, you know, the, um, the Gaza conflict has highlighted both sides think they are expressing a set of values. Um, so, how should how do you think advisors should deal with the fact uh, should deal with the, the you know, the uniqueness of a set of ethical issues for each client in, in a um, systematic and sort of manageable way? Um, this is a completely personal perspective. Um, I, I've kind of evolved my thinking over the last seven years at being at Australian Ethical, and I think using the word values kind of softens it a little bit too much. It is important. Evidently, you're responding to your client's values, but those values... A far, you know, there's, there's a whole diverse range of values that you're managing investments to, right? If we think of ethical values, like moral values, what, invest, what maybe the next generation is thinking about, consumer benchmarking that RIA um, does every year is a really great guide to the changing expectations around investments. Climate is always the number one issue and understanding where someone is on that journey, whether they actually want to exclude uh, coal, oil and gas, whether they want to invest um, positively into renewables and infrastructure, understanding where they are on that issue. But I think you can probably break it down to five or six key issues. Um, uh, sorry, um, supply chain and labour and uh, human rights is an issue for, for many, many of the Gen um, X and millennials and also animal cruelty and testing. They're the, probably the three big ones, but there's probably five or six that if you in, um, incorporated them into your questioning, you would get a fairly good perspective on whether it is an issue or not um, and where they are on the spectrum of that issue. Now, I do know that makes it complex for you. Um, and you then think, well, how do I run this in a scalable way in a business? Um, and so thinking about having an RI solution that you can offer clients that do that does address some of these issues. Using things like SMAs, we produce SMAs and we're talking about producing a lot more um, in the coming sort of 12 to 18 months uh, where you can exclude. I don't think you'd need to exclude from ours, but it does give you a little bit more of an opportunity to be able to, to, to respond to those, um, those needs from the investors. Thank you very much, Leah. We'll have to cut it there.